John McNeil was given a life sentence in prison for shooting and killing a man that he and his son say attacked them in his own backyard. Witnesses say the man attacked John McNeil and his son and police said that what McNeil did was only protecting his home and his family but he still got a life sentence. He served six and a half years and was given a 13 year probation. In order to get that probation, he had to say he was guilty of a charge that he had already been acquitted of. We're here today with John McNeil. He's gonna to talk to us about his ordeal and that 13 year probation. Welcome to the newest dialogue in politics community news, human interest stories, entertainment, and information from Eastern North Carolina. Janet Connor Knox is an award-winning journalist with more than 25 years experience in print, radio, and television. This is Talking With Janet. We're here with John G. McNeil, who is back in Wilson, North Carolina after a horrific experience in Georgia. John, tell us a little bit about the day of that incident to take mm -hmm. you back. Same, it's back. same almost like it was yesterday um, when I got a call from my late son, Ron McNeil, um, stating that we had your son? Uh, a person, your yeah, son, my other son. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have two sons, John Jr., John II, and Dan LaRon. The youngest call said that uh, someone was in the backyard and that he didn't know who the person was and that uh, he said the guy had threatened him. So I told him something, run in the house, I called 911. We was talking by way of two way next tail. So, and I also had a personal cell phone. So I told him I called 911, see if he can get in the house, which I did. Um, I was coming from dropping off my late wife, Anita McNeil. She had to run into her office. And it, would, and it was about 15 minutes away from where, where we lived at in Kennesaw. So when you get a call from your son, I'm being threatened, what happened? How, how, did, how was your heart? What happened? Well, my night? heart was racing. The only thing I could think of was just getting home uh, to protect my son, you know, that's what a father does is protect his uh, wife, sons, daughters, and his property. So, of course, that's what I did, and I thought I was doing what was right. Um, when I, I, as I was heading home, I called 911, and uh, they got me on the line. And, of course, you probably can hear it or know the story. You know, of course, they recorded me saying that, uh, hurry up, get the cops there. Um, I'm on my way home and when I get there, I might, that's the key word. I didn't say I was going to do it, I said I might just whoop his ass. Because, in that, and I use that terminology in terms of... You were upset. Being mad. Yeah, you were upset. Uh, someone just threatened to kill my son, had a uh, switchblade knife out, uh, I guess you want to call it a boss cutter, but it was one of the guys that opened up with a razor on it. And I had it up to his neck, and you anybody know where the jiggler's at? You get hit there, only takes seconds before you before you bleed to death. So I uh, surprisingly beat the police to my house, and they they lived only that the station was only about three minutes away from my home in Kennesaw, over off of Irvine Way. So I get home, I pull in the driveway. Of course, the gentleman was uh, on a Justin property. He wasn't on my property. At the time he noticed I pulled it, pulled home, I pulled as closest to my uh, garage as possible in hopes of going in home in my house to see where my son was at. Um, last conversation we had, I told him to get in the house and I would call 911 so I didn't talk to him from that grace period. So I didn't know whether he was in the house, laying behind the house with his throat slit. The only thing I was thinking in terms of getting in the house mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, none of that took place because as I pulled in my driveway, as I stated a few minutes ago, the gentleman reached in his truck, pulled something out black, stuck in his right pocket, and just dashed over to my property. He was off my property, but he dashed onto my property. At that time, I seen him coming fast, and uh, thank God that I did have a firearm. Normally, I don't carry firearms around with me, but 
we was in the process of selling my old property over in Powder Springs, Georgia, and we had guys going in looking looking at the property with real estate people, so I didn't want to leave a farm in there. And then, of course, the new house in Kennesaw, we had interior decorators that was headed over there, so I didn't want to leave a farm in the house with my youngest son either. So that's the reason why I had a farm with me. Uh, when the gentleman rushed over, only thing I could think of that he was coming to hurt me because the last response I heard is that he told my son he was going to kill him. So as I'm driving home, speeding 100 miles an hour, trying to get there, I'm just thinking he done did something of that nature. You follow what I'm saying? So when I get there and see him rush over to him, I'm thinking he's coming to hurt me. And in fact, that's what he was trying to do. Um, I jumped out. Yeah, first, I grabbed the gun out of the glove compartment, took it out the case, showed him that I had a farm through the wonder. Just raised it up in the car and kept coming. So by the time I put a clip in the bottom of it, it was a 9mm, Smith & Weston. Mm -hmm. uh, he had made his way around to the back side of the driver's side of the car and I jumped out. I had to pull the door open and run around the front and keep him from getting on me. So he stopped, went right back around the other side of the car. So at this point he's chasing you? Yeah, chasing me. I'm backing up with a father. Mm -hmm. You know, he was coming at me, calling me all kind of names and I'm telling him, back up, I don't want to hurt you. And uh, he closed the distance from about, I don't know, 10, 8 feet to like arm's length, maybe two and a half feet or whatever. And at that time, uh, when he got about three feet, I guess I gave a warning shot in the ground. Uh, at that point, he sped up faster. So at that point, I had no other choice. I just pulled the, the farm up in the shot. I didn't know if it hit him, went over his head or hit him anywhere. The only thing I know, I had to move out of the way to keep him from falling face forward on me. So the cops got there, and uh, once the cops got there, I had unloaded the gun side on the back step. By then, my son, at the time, came out the front door. Okay. This is really good. I'm sorry, but we're going to be right back. I'm sorry. We'll be right back. Hollywood. 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 It's not for everybody. And it's not supposed to be. When I was like three or four, I went up to my mom and I told her that I wanted to be an actress. Of course, I don't want to be famous. People come here with this dream of glitter and the streets paved with gold. There's a lot of people to talk about it. I wasn't prepared. It's almost impossible for everybody in this business to be a multi-millionaire star. There's a constant battle that I'm not physically the right type. Why does it have to be that the black girl, if she is a love interest and she's overweight, that it has to be, oh, I couldn't believe he liked me. It's tough to be a gay man who happens to be black. In Hollywood, they say, okay, so you could play the sassy best friend who shops with the girls and tells them what they should and shouldn't wear. Uh, Hollywood is smoking mirrors. I've been to the other side of Hollywood. He almost killed me. My son's voice saved my life. Some people, Hollywood becomes what they breathe, what they live. They don't know how to take Hollywood off when the AD says it's a wrap. You can either release yourself from it or you can stick around for the sinking. You know you have to carve out your own journey. There's a lot of people who live in this business, a lot of people who are of this business, a lot of people who just work in it. You're an unusual man that, and that you're an African American, all white witnesses. Police department side with you, and yet that wasn't good enough. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. um, the town you lived in was Kennesaw, yes. and there was a particular law in Kennesaw where homeowners had to own guns and, and um, not only just the handgun but bullets as well. Am I correct? That's correct. So you were within the law. Mm -hmm. I was within the law. Um, you would think. Looking back at the whole situation from a lay person perspective, because we, you know, I'm not a lawyer, don't have a law degree, but when you look at it and you look at the laws that have been brought forth 
and have been put into law, made law, you would think that they would apply to all people, no matter who you are, what color you are, that's in Kennesaw. And I think looking at the law and looking at how the law was applied, um, I don't think that I even had a shot because stand your ground and castle doctrine was never put forth. Mm -hmm. They said it was self-defense. Mm -hmm. um, self-defense put you in a box. To me, personally, looking at it now from a lady man's pr perspective, I don't think you anyone will ever want to lose use self-defense again. That's a law to send you to jail. Contrary to castle doctrine, stand your ground. Had stand your ground been presented I think they would have no other choice but to free me. You know, in America, you know, it's a lot of cases that one would think that there's some similarities, mm -hmm. but when you actually look at it as a whole, there's no comparison. Do you believe race played a, a part in what happened to you? I do. I really do. Um, when you look at the case as a whole, when you're talking about a white gentleman getting shot compared to compared to a black gentleman getting shot. There's so many cases and so many variances that you can look at that only leads to one thing, and that's race. Tell me something, how long did it take them, the district attorney, to decide to indict you? You went home, everything's fine, you're thinking, okay, I'm sorry this man is dead, I'm, you know, but we're gonna do the best we can to move forward, am I correct? And then how long did it take for them to say, ah, this is not over? Well, well, let's go back to, if we can recall, when I said the night, the day of the incident, night of the incident, the evening, of the evening of the incident, when we went down for the interrogation part, right? This is the same DA that looked at it and said, it's clearly self-defense. So I don't know what possibly went wrong because there was never new, no new evidence, right? With this same DA, right? 274 days later. Almost a year. Almost a year. Still no new evidence. You said a crime had been committed. Was it because you was running for re-election for district attorney? Or what was it? Is it possible that he got pressure? That's a possibility, but I can't even imagine what kind of pressure you possibly could be getting if you did the right thing initially. So you can't tell me a man, as you allegedly said, murder someone and you let roam the street for 274 days? That's not law. That's not practical. Absolutely. So now, you, you, you're at home, you get arrested. Yes. And August, yeah. August the 10th, uh, they convened with, to me, and I'm going to say this on the record, so they can go check me, a bootleg grand jury because I'm going to call it a bootleg grand jury because I have two different indictments to prove my theory. Mm -hmm. And and then you come back, right? Allegedly, August the 10th, a true bill came down on the indictment for murder. Malice murder, felony murder, voluntary manslaughter. That's the first charges that came down. Allegedly, I got locked up on the 11th. By the time I went to a bond hearing on September the 9th, another grand jury, different names, different makeup, came with another true bill. How many true bills can you get for one incident? For the same incident. This time it says malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, the aggravated assault, and voluntary manslaughter. Right? So now, I get out on a million dollar bond on September 9th. Trial start the very next month, October the 30th. Where's the investigation on both sides? That's so short a period of time, you, you would might as well say it was a kangaroo court or kangaroo trial. Mm -hmm. It takes years to bring a murder trial, to, to bring a murder case to trial. So you're telling me, 30 days or possibly maybe a little less, you're going to go to trial. Now, when we get to trial, you're going to, the jury, the same jury is going to acquit me 
on the first charge. Okay, what was the first charge? Malice murder. So you're found not guilty, not guilty of malice on murder. On the very first charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for giggles sakes, let's go to the very last charge, okay. right? I'm going to come back to the second and third, mm -hmm. which is voluntary manslaughter. Mm -hmm. The jury found me not guilty, right? So let's come back. They said they found me guilty on aggravated assault, right? So since they found me guilty on aggravated assault, that was the underlying felony for felony murder. But let me say something here. If I'm retreating on my property with my firearm and I get somebody that's on the attack, that's attacking me, there's never no aggravated circumstances there. If any lawyers look at this, call me, write me, let me help me to understand where is the aggravated service. You said when I raise my, my firearm, well, I'm being attacked on my property. If I can't protect my property and my family, where can I? I thought this was the United States of America, and you had liberty to protect your home. So in Georgia, um, um, the, the castle law is that you don't have to necessarily see a weapon, you just have to feel threatened. Yes, and, and you felt threatened. Very much so. And so now you go through the trial, you're found guilty, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you were shocked to be found. Were you shocked? I was very much shocked, because I was under the impression I was going home. Um, and when I heard the first charge, not guilty, I said in my mind, okay, I'm going home, they finally see the justice in this. But when they came back on felony murder, I'm guilty. How can I? How can you find second degree murder? That's improper. And you're given a life sentence. A life sentence, and I served six years on a life sentence, and I get out on some particular stuff. And when I say stuff, I had my late wife that was dying, so they wanted to rush me so I wouldn't change my mind on the plea deal that that they wanted me to take. And which I still don't understand for the life of me. I've been acquitted by a jury of voluntary manslaughter. But the courts of Cobb County says the only way we'll let you go, you got to plea to voluntary manslaughter. And I've been found and I've been acquitted of that charge. Uh, grieving for my wife's death and my mom's death. So um, just a sad time for me right now. Any sense of relief? Mm. I haven't yet thought about it. Uh, John Hickey was um, um, charged with murder and, and then uh, found guilty. And he is back home, as you can see. Um, when, we, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about what prison life was like. We'll be right back right after this. What's all this? Dad, can't you knock? We're back with John McNeil. It's it's too much um, to tell in the short amount of time that we have, but give us a hint of what prison life was like. I mean, because before you went to prison, let's just say this though: before you went to prison, you were a businessman. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. You had just completed a wonderful deal. Tell, tell me a little bit about that, and, uh, and talk about being yanked away from your life. Your middle, your clearly, clearly middle class life to I was, going to prison. I was working for a company in Atlanta, and um, I was working on two deals. One was up near the South Carolina line, um, carry on trailer. I can, I can, you know, say the name. Mm -hmm. And I 
had just closed a deal with them uh, doing $1.9 million a month in sales with them on pressure treated lawnmowers for these long distance trailer trailers that you see on the, on the highways and interstates. And uh, I was pleased that that happened. So many guys was going up against me for that bid and um, I got that one. $1.9 million a month. Yes. Nothing to sneeze at. Whew. That was a blessing. That's great. Uh, I couldn't believe it when it asked. People work all year for that much. Yeah, for that. You're doing much. it every month. Yeah. All right. So, so I was in the process of having my eye on another deal that I was working night and day on. Um, I even took the company out on several outings, trying to buy my way in, so to speak, with the company that I worked for money. Mm -hmm. And um, I can recall. Uh, just for the sense of it happened, it was with foundation contractors. And I like to uh, say thank you to a late friend that since went on home to glory, Mr. Eddie Coyles. Mm -hmm. And he was the president of that company. And uh, he called me in one evening and told me to meet him at his office. I didn't know what it was about. And uh, I got there, I seen like 10 cars in his parking lot. I said, whoa, what's going on here? So I walked in, I didn't know what to expect. So he come in, he always liked to look serious. He said, sit down. He said, uh, I wanted to say this to you. He said, uh, did you give me the lowest prices you possibly can? And I said, yes, sir, I did. And uh, he said, I don't know about that. I had somebody else come lower than you. So my heart started beating fast. And I said, uh, okay. I said, well, if you allow me, give me a second look. He said, no, I don't have time for second looks. He said, and by the way, I don't always go with the cheapest guy anyway, because cheap always not good. So I said, okay, I don't know what this guy really looking for. He, so he uh, took the the purchase order and just threw it across the table. He didn't slide it, just threw it across the table to me. So I stopped and I looked and I tried to keep up my poker face as if I wasn't excited. And I seen $194 million. That's quite a deal. That's quite a deal. So you're living in a mansion. Yes, it was a nice house. You were living in a mansion. It was a nice house. How many bedrooms? It was eight bedrooms. Eight bedroom home, um, driving luxury cars, um, Rolex watches, and the whole nine yards. From that to prison. It was almost like Job, if I can go biblical. Oh man, Job. Having everything to losing everything. You talking about the lowest and the poorest conditions. You know, TV give it no justice. You know, they can clean it up, make it look like what they want it to look like. But if you have the opportunity to go in there when the camera's not rolling, it's something totally different than you can imagine. You talking about no no don't you don't even know the food you eat. Mystery mystery food. The conditions, the showers, the beds, everything. And those guys are really living like bosses. So now one one quick thing is that when you go to, when you're living in those conditions, people think, oh, well, they're there, they're supposed to be there. You said you ran into a lot of innocent people there. Hundreds of people. Matter of fact, I was doing, I was doing paralegal work and I became familiar with a lot of cases in there. So it, it's, it was just a horrible, and then you were, you were put in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement for something that I never knew I didn't do, and it was like the third, well, the same day I got there from county jail to prison, and we went to eat dinner and went to church because uh, you know I figured I need a lot of God in my life because man I'm in I'm in something that man or woman couldn't get me out of, so I figured that I need to go get God in my life. So I went to church, went back, after church was over with, went back, got in this cell that a guy that I knew nothing about. So the next morning we went to breakfast about 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning. And uh, from there we went to orientation. That's the last time I seen uh, uh, anything else because mm -hmm. they said that I was jacking on a lady like I'm some animal or something. And they told me it was a B-11. I had no idea what that was. And so you were thrown in, thrown in. solitary for 90 days. And then afterwards they told you you were not guilty. Yeah, they said this one is on us. Wow. Yeah. We're going to be right back. We're going to be joined with Jim Boykin, who's going to talk about 
Um, what's coming up next for John? He's trying to help John, even though John is out. John is 13 years probation. That's a long probation. Nobody has ever received that much probation. 13 years. We'll be right back. We'll be joined uh, by Jim Blake. I did something terrible. I don't know what I was thinking. This is dangerous. I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, don't hurt me. Whoa, that's crazy. Valentina, you're beautiful. Beautiful. We're back, and we're joined now by uh, Jim Boykin, who is here, a good friend of John McNeil's, and he's here to talk about some of his involvement with John. Uh, and since you, you you were here, you read in the paper about what was going on with John, you knew John from when he was in high school. What, were you, what did you think when you read the paper? Well, I taught and coached at Fife for over 30 years, and uh, I, I met John, I think he was a sophomore, maybe and uh, that was the year they won the state championship in basketball and John was a star player and so I knew John all three years he was in high school and uh, you know didn't really keep up with him after that and uh, I guess over 30 years passed or close to 30 years and I don't remember how I first found out about this case I, I think I read it in the Daily Times and uh, I went on the internet did a little bit of research and read up on it uh, some articles from some papers in Georgia and I remember get, getting up and going into the other room and telling my wife, who, who doesn't know, who didn't know John, and I, I said, that, that's not John McNeil. He's not a, a murderer. He's not a killer. Uh, you know, John's a very mild-mannered guy. And, and even after all he's gone through, there's not a vindictive bone in his body. And, uh, so it kind of hurts you to see a Wilson guy being treated like that? Well, it, 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 it does. And, and you know, you, you, you think we've come a long way and then things like this happen and you just, you, you, you just, I don't know, I'm not discouraged about where society's going, but we've got a ways to go. And, uh, you know, th th this case is it's just a tragedy. But you've decided to come on board with a whole group of people to help John raise money because you still have 13 years, or how much is 10 years now? Like, right? yeah, 10 years. 10 years, because you've been out for three years mm -hmm. working in the community, okay, in the community. and helping children. And children working in the school system. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity by the formal superintendent to uh, get me cleared to work in the school system. Mm -hmm. So I am working over at the, an alternative school, and I'm also a site coordinator and are off site for the Trinity students. And that's a whole other topic when one of these days we'll get back and talk about uh, the alternatives to a person after they get out of prison. But 13 years probation is unheard of. And tell me, tell me what you guys, you guys, I know it's the mayor and Kimberly Van Dyke is a whole group of you guys getting together. And yeah, I, 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 I hesitate to try to mention everybody on the committee. I believe somebody out. I don't yeah. to do that. Oh, it's out, of, it, it's out of love. It's not out of it. But yeah. It, it is, but yeah. um, you know, we have a we have a committee we put together. We're gonna we're trying to raise some money so that we can go back into Georgia, uh, you know, hire an attorney and try to get John's record expunged. And 13 years of probation is just I mean that's crazy. That's just crazy. And. Uh, you know, we, we need to get something done about this. And I, you know, I, I want to call on all people that, uh, you know, love justice, first of all. Uh, people that are, you know, fans of high school basketball around here. Remember John. People that just believe in decency. To get involved with this and to help us out. And uh, the, the first thing we're doing, we're going to have a Super Bowl golf tournament on August 17th. It's a Wednesday at Wedgwood. Uh, we need teams and we need T sponsors. A team is two hundred dollars. T sponsors are a hundred dollars each. We can put anything on your sign that you'd like. Um, you know, we can advertise your business. We can scan your your business card and have your phone number and your web address. Anything you want on there. Uh, we also would encourage people to uh, 
you know, do tea signs in memory of someone or in honor of someone. Oh, that would be really nice. Exactly, and and uh, but 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 we really want the community to support this. This is a way to help John. You've heard John's story. You know that uh, you know this is a you know something that uh, turned his world upside down. And I, I don't know that it can all ever be righted. No, it can't be. But we can right some of the injustice. And that, um, and that would allow him to be able to be off probation and be a regular American. Exactly, and, um, and, and you know, I, I just this could happen to anybody. I hope people realize that. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or brown or green or whatever. This could happen to people. Tell me and, something. Um, 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 how does a person get in contact with you guys to to be a part of this whole thing? Okay, uh, there is a website, justiceforjohnmcneil.com, uh, the number four, justice for John, for the, the number four, McNeil, M-C-N-E-I-L.com. You can go to that website, uh, you can copy an entry blank for the tournament. It's got phone numbers on it that uh, people can call and get in. We're going to put that up for you so that it, we'll put that up so you can Exactly, you thank, can see thank you for doing that. and. Uh, you know, you don't even have to know John. I think having watched the interview y'all just did, you can see a lot about who John is. He's, like I said, he's not vindictive at all. He's very, very sorry this happened. But this, as I said, this could happen to anybody. How much money are you trying to raise? We would like to raise eventually about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, and that's okay. what it's going to cost to to get this done. Uh, the Super Bowl is our first activity. Um, we're going to uh, also uh, be having a gospel sing at some point, uh, mm -hmm. probably September or so. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in the works. And uh, but so people can make way. donations. You don't you don't have to you don't have to be a golfer. You can do a T sign to help us out. You don't have to be a golfer. You don't have to have golf clubs, uh, anything like that. Uh, we want you to if you do a T sign, we want you to come out and have uh, lunch with us that day. Lunch will be provided. Um, come out and fellowship with uh, with John and every everyone else is coming out there to support him and uh, we want to make this a community event. Good to be back in Wilson, isn't it? It's awesome to be back here and be back in the communities yeah. and being around people that love you. You can feel the love even here. You can feel it and it's so genuine and I can't think of another place I'd rather be. Any other final thoughts you guys? Well just you know let's get this done and uh, we need your help. We need, we need everyone's help in doing this. We need to get it done. John is one of our local guys. Uh, he went through a terrible tragedy, and um, he needs our help. And, and that's what Wilson should be about. We should be about helping our neighbors, and this is a great opportunity to do that. Now, what we have um, is John McNeil and Jim Boykin inviting us. Uh, John is uh, a man who spent six and a half years in prison. Um, in the meantime, his wife died, his mother died, and he got 13 years probation. Uh, John McNeil has written a book about his ordeal, and it begins um, with him here in Wilson, North Carolina. It goes all the way through his release, and he's looking for a publisher. I've read the book. It is awesome, and it's something that anybody would want to read, and it's done in his voice. And we're, you're still looking for a publisher, yeah, am I correct? A publisher, that's correct. Jim is waiting for you. He needs you to help him out with the with the um, with the golf tournament. John needs your help. Thank you very much for watching. Talking to Jim. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Talking with Janet please contact us by email, brothersideent at gmail.com. Leave your name and contact information. Without that, your guests will not be considered. This has been a Brotherside Entertainment production.